Let's get started right into it. So we left off on Friday talking about client-side cross-site scripting, right? So what fundamentally what is cross-site scripting? So somebody help us. What is cross-site scripting? What? Yeah, so the main idea is, right, in a browser, we're somehow getting somebody else's code is executing, but when we visit random web pages, right, somebody else's code is executing on our machine, right? So what's the difference between that and cross-site scripting? The violation of same origin. Yes, the same origin policy, right? The key problem is that that code came from somebody else's origin, but it's being executed in the same origin as trusted site, right? And once it's accessed there, it has, once it's uh, executing in that same origin, it has access to every. So we talked about the different types of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. We talked about reflected and stored and client-side cross-site scripting. One of actually the really cool things that can happen with stored cross-site scripting is cross-site scripting can be wormable, which is pretty cool. So what's a worm? Not like the thing in the ground, but like a computer worm. So yeah. it's like if you inject anything, it will spread within that whole network inside. Yeah, so there's kind of some key properties, right? So a worm usually exploits some security vulnerability on your system. Then when it gets on one system, it scans the network looking for more systems that are vulnerable. When it finds them, it propagates to them, finds more things that are vulnerable, propagates there. Right, just like the original Morris worm that took down the internet, right, that we looked at. And it actually may seem kind of crazy, but there are cross-site scripting worms in the web context. Mainly this shows up and this occurs in social networking web applications. That's kind of the main thing here. The idea is if there exists some stored cross-site scripting vulnerability on a user accessible action, right? So think about my profile page on Facebook. If there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability on my profile page, I can inject JavaScript code. And then when anybody goes and visits my site, right, they're going to execute that JavaScript code. And that JavaScript code can then edit their own profile to copy itself into their code into their profile, and then when anybody visits their profile, they're executing that code, so that JavaScript code can then copy itself to their profile page and spread throughout the network in this way. Uh, so it's a self-propagating worm, so it's actually super cool. It's JavaScript code that's able to completely copy and clone itself. Uh, social networks are particularly susceptible, so there is a pretty famous Sammy is my hero case in MySpace that we're gonna look at. But this also happens more recently. So TweetDeck is a Twitter application, and it had a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So you could send a tweet that contains some JavaScript code, and when the user views that tweet on TweetDeck, it would post a new tweet containing that code. So that anybody who saw that code on their system would tweet that same code, right? And so it would spread throughout the network. So the, my, the, the MySpace case, anybody actually was on MySpace? Remember MySpace? Oh God, it's like Facebook, before Facebook. All right, so there was this thing, the Sammy is my hero, so this one person created a, a worm on MySpace, a cross-site scripting worm, and it added its code, but it also added to the hero section of their MySpace profile but most of all, Sammy is my hero. And this was, let's see, oh, it doesn't have all that, but you can see all of the people here that had these, and then you can see the third result is MySpace got hacked, question mark, question mark. So what happened was, so this, I don't know, MSN, who uses MSN? These, all these pictures are from the person who reported the vulnerability. Uh, so this is like, 3,500 pages 
that have this Sammy is my hero in them on myspace.com or had. And the other thing that it would do, so it would, the code would copy itself to the user's profile page, add this Sammy is my hero, and also send Sammy a friend request. I guess that was cool back then, right? Having a lot of friends. And so he, this is a picture of Sammy's own feed. He had, what is this? 919,000 friend requests from doing this worm, right? Remember, this is, this is the crazy thing, right? You have a social network, so once it is really spread like viral. Whenever anybody sees that worm, they automatically propagate it to their own friends, and those people propagate it to their friends, and those to those friends. Um, I did not do any of these captions here, by the way. <laughs> this is from Sammy. Disclaimer. So this kind of shows maybe the power of cross-site scripting vulnerability, right? If we get have one of these. We can propagate it throughout the network, a stored cross-site scripting like this, right? And this is kind of just one of the bad things that we saw can happen with cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. We also saw how we can steal cookies, how we can change the UI of the page, how we can fish with cross-site scripting, how we can make requests to the web server, do all these kinds of things. So how do we solve it? Isn't it easy? How do we solve it? Turn off JavaScript. Mm, turn off JavaScript for the entire web? <laughs> that may be a good way for you to prevent your own self from running into these problems. Anybody try, does anybody browse with JavaScript turned off by default? Yeah, do you actually do? With, uh, with what extension do you use? Do you do Firefox, Safety, or Ah, do you like selectively allow it on certain domains? Sometimes I do. Mostly you do enable it. Wait, wait. You enable or disable what? JavaScript or the extension? JavaScript. So you mostly do enable it, but you have done it with not. Okay. Yeah, that sounds more safe. Right. Yeah, so you can you can actually do pretty well. I mean, browsing the you, you should be able to, theoretically, right? JavaScript is just a scripting language. Anybody, I know some of you are, have done professional web development stuff, right? So you've actually one of the kind of theories or ideas in web development is you want your websites to gracefully degrade, right? So they should, you know, if the browser supports all the fancy JavaScript animations, Ajax, everything, right? Then you can use that, but if they don't, right? If they're on an older machine, then they, your website should still be useful and usable to them. Unfortunately, that's often not the case nowadays, right? So, and it's gonna be more and more as we go further and further and developers are going to assume that everybody has JavaScript, and anybody who turns it off is a monster. Uh, you're not going to be able to browse the web, unfortunately. And that only prevents you, right? That's only a one-person defense. If you wanted to deploy that to everyone, you'd have to disable JavaScript across the entire web, which would be a, a very tall task indeed. So what else? What are some other ways we can solve this problem? Purifier and code, right? Yeah. So, what's the key problem? I mean, from the examples we saw with the script tags, what's the problem? Yeah. So, what causes the script execution? Mixing up data. Right. So, the fact that we have the angle bracket, which tells the browser's parsing engine, "Hey, start parsing a new a new script tag." Right? So we've kind of already seen, well, why don't we just sanitize all angle brackets to their HTML entity equivalent, right? Why don't we just do ampersand LT semicolon, right? And then we've gotten rid of all cross-site scripting. So why isn't that enough? So 
So expand on that a little bit more. What sites are going to break? If I sites that are doing, I mean, there are probably valid sites out there where they're doing things that look like cross-site scripting, but it's actually valid. Yes, that could be, but I mean, if you're letting your users upload and execute JavaScript, you've probably already lost the game by design. Well, not necessarily upload. I'm saying the developers could design the web page to be sending that information through URLs. Right, it. right, which is also a bad idea. <laughs> but yes, yeah, that actually does happen. Yeah. Um, and coding uh, is not useful to say. Uh, if the program is using the user inside the JavaScript code itself. Mm, okay. Yeah, right, so what if, let's go, write some code, not like the calculus. Right, what if I have, right, I'm inside an HTML page, right? So HTML entities encoding does what? It transforms this character to, oh, this actually gets confusing. Like this, right? Standardization transforms less than symbol to there, right? But what about inside my tag, What if the user input is here? What if, okay, this user input, we'll say it's somewhere. Right? Mm -hmm. Do we need a less than symbol now? What do we need? Double quotes, right? Because we're inside double quotes here, inside an attribute of, inside a value of an attribute inside of a tag, right? So we saw, um, we saw that huge list of cross-site scripting vectors, right? One of those would be uh, on, let's say, mouse over, right? So here, what if for a class here, we put our username as uh, double quotes space on mouse over alert one. So this part is our, let's see, what this highlight? Uh, okay. Sorry. Right? So that this part here is everything that we put in. So is this going to execute JavaScript that I want? Did I need any less than symbols? Yeah. Did I? From my input? So if you're doing HTML entities and you're changing all less than symbols to ampersand LT semicolon, does this help you here? No. And in fact, I think we need to look it up maybe, but I believe HTML entities will not encode a double quote. Because a double quote is fine with HTML entities. It's not one of these special characters in HTML, in a case like here, right? In this here, now we need some kind of script tag, right, to start executing script. Or we need to start some kind of a tag. So here we need, if you think about parsing, right, we need a less than symbol to transition the browser's parsing engine to start a tag, and then the tag name, and then some JavaScript, right? But here, in this, context, right, of the browser's parsing engine, here I need a less than symbol to transition to JavaScript execution. When I'm inside this attribute here, mm -hmm. what do I need to transition? Double a double quote and probably a space, right? But we saw there's actually different ways that we can do this. We can also saw that attributes can actually be single quoted, right? So I could have the user input here, in which case I just need single quotes. Mm. It can actually be also without quotes, even, where now I just need a space. And then going back to the other point, people have written web applications. Have you ever done something like this? <coughs> so the, So what's 
this toad trying to do? What's the purpose here? Like, why would a developer write some code like this? Set the variable name, name in the JavaScript to what's on the PHP. So yes. So essentially, passing variables, passing data from the server side code to the client side code, right? At runtime, whatever that name variable is is going to be substituted in there, so that JavaScript code will now have access to this name variable. This is actually exactly how some, uh, oh, we need to go to this, yeah. Uh, this actually happens a lot even in things like, uh, what's the big Microsoft uh, SharePoint, I think? No, right, yeah. I can't remember the framework, but there's actually a lot of uh, web application frameworks that use techniques like this <laughs> to pass information to the JavaScript code, right? So now here, now what do I need? Do I need to start a new script tag to execute JavaScript? What do I need? I replace the domain name with here in the code. I mean a semicolon and whatever you want. What do I need? So I'm in here, so I'm the attacker. What am I gonna type in? A single code, semicolon. What do I do about the sub at the end? Comment. Yeah, I can comment it out, right? So now here, but see, I don't need, all I need is a double quote. I don't even need spaces. I, I don't need an on mouse over or any of these things that are kind of known to be bad, right? And why? Why don't I need any of those? I'm already, the output, the user input is being used inside of a script tag. So it is already being used as JavaScript, right? Think about the browser parsing engine. It's already inside JavaScript parsing. I just need to figure out how to transition it from JavaScript string to something else, right? You can even do this. Um, I did find, uh, when I was doing some pen testing work, there was basically like a JSON object that was being returned. And so they weren't escaping that correctly, so we could bust out of the object in that way, but this exact same technique. Um, so you can have, yeah, something like. But yeah, it just all depends on the exact application, right? So when we talk about sanitization, right, that's typically the problem is, hey, we just need to sanitize and everything will be okay. The key core problem with cross-site scripting is that what sanitization do you use? There is no magic bullet, use this one sanitization and everything's gonna be okay. Different sanitization needs to be applied depending on where in the HTML this output is being used. So it boils down to, to me this is really the funda one of the fundamental reasons of why there is so many cross-site scripting vulnerabilities on the web today is that it's, it's very difficult, very, it's very difficult to have a silver bullet solution that just fixes all of these in all possible instances. Basically, you need to have every piece of data that's returned to the user must be sanitized. And this is everything that could possibly come from the user. Get parameters, post parameters, cookies, request headers, database content, file content. What if you're pulling things in from Twitter? And including that. What if there's actually, there are cases of people who have written books on web security that included cross-site scripting examples that caused vulnerabilities on book websites, like in like the preview pages and stuff. Yeah, is that nuts? Right? There's actually, there's a lot of work on mobile phones. So a lot of your mobile phones, if you have like QR code readers, there's been some vulnerabilities that people have of if you encode script tags as a QR code in some of the readers, mm -hmm. because it's using basically an HTML-based application, it will cause a cross-site scripting vulnerability through a QR code on your mobile phone. Isn't that nuts? There's actually uh, a, oh, I should pull this example. 
So a while, so every remember like the Apple thing, like the case with the FBI about trying to crack the phones and all that. Um, actually, recently after that, there was a group of cryptographers that said that they actually were able to break the iMessage encryption, so that they were able to read messages on iPhones through that. And that is, is super cool. And then another group came out like about a week after that that said actually there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability on iMessage on Mac OS X. Apparently the Mac OS X messages is just a browser, an embedded browser. And so by sending proper cross, uh, a cross-site scripting text message to somebody, if they read it on their, on their Mac OS X, mm -hmm. it would cause it to execute arbitrary JavaScript, which would extract all the messages that you ever sent to anyone and send it to whoever, just through a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of interesting because I was wondering, it's a bit of um, like an aside, but are a lot of uh, applications in web and in, in mobile like not developed natively? Like obviously we would expect the iMessage to be native, but all right, I don't know how, like how much research is in your research partially in mobile. Yeah. So actually, we've done research on that exact question. Of I call them, I like to use the term mobile web apps. So they're not just mobile applications, like native applications, and they're not just web applications. Uh, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it was a surprising number of, we, I think we had 1.1 million Android apps that we analyzed to see if they use an embedded browser. Then we tried to answer questions like, what are they going to? Are they going to a remote site? Are they going to a local site? I think it was in the 70% or something where mobile had an embedded browser. Not that that was their primary UI, that's really difficult to tell, but at least used an embedded browser. And then we found all kinds of crazy problems, like they would use SSL, so they would go to HTTPS sites, specifically you know, because they're loading code, but it turns out that they were suppressing all SSL errors in the code, like they explicitly put code to override a method that said on SSL error, do nothing. So you could trivially man in the middle of these websites and send them any kind of JavaScript you want. Um, there were, one actually case that I really like, uh, we identified all the domains were being accessed and then we did a lookup on those domains and we found that actually some of those domains had expired. And so we, we registered, I think, 10 of those domains and saw how many people were contacting us. Which is crazy, right? I mean, we could have sent them, we sent them like a 404 or something. But we could have sent them literally any, any content we wanted, it would have been executed on that device, right? So the same origin policy would mean that we would get access to whatever that site got access to, but still, I mean, it's. Then to make things even crazier, what actually drove this whole research is prior to Android, I believe, 4.2, there was a vulnerability, so part of what they do, normally a, a, these embedded browsers are very dumb. Right? They have no additional functionality. They're just, they're not at the same power level as a native app, right? A native app can access the contacts, assuming you give it permission, right, all that stuff. So there's actually a functionality called the JavaScript bridge interface, which gives you access to a Java object, a native Java object through JavaScript. And this bridge is not restricted by the same origin policy. It's to the entire browser, the entire embedded browser. So anything you open, no matter what frame it's in or anything, has access to these Java objects. Now that's A, a big problem on the first place. The second thing is, it turns out with Java, with Java, using reflection, you can get to like a class object, and then you can eventually get to a system call so you can execute arbitrary code as long as you have one of these Java objects in JavaScript. So that's what we were studying. So we could have you know, sent these, and we actually developed some exploits of, it's actually really fun. You could like go to our website and we could, uh, so we're running as the permissions of the web browser, so we could steal all your cookies for all your sites. We could brick your phone by making you run a fork bomb. Uh, that was a really fun one. All from a web, like JavaScript code, so yeah. But why? Why would uh, iMessage, which is developed by Apple, why would they develop it like that? Is it is it because it's easier to do web yeah. apps? Or I think it's easier, it's right? Business? Yeah, and it's portable. I mean, in that way, right? Uh, this is why a lot of mobile apps do this. Is especially there's frameworks like uh, Cordova, I think, is one where you write your application 
as a web application, and then you could run it on Android or iPhone or Windows Phone. And it's the same web application. And they do the binding so that you can still access contacts and all that stuff. So, yeah. Anyways, OK. Cool. Back to this stuff. Um, right, so languages, right, you need to do this encoding yourself for cross-site scripting. Um, and the key part is, is that sanitization must be performed differently depending on where the data is used. And this is what makes it very tricky. You can't just say, okay, I know I'm going to use this username, so I'm going to encode this username once, and then every time I use it, it's going to be safe. Every specific time that it's used, and it's not the server side path, it depends on exactly where that is being used in the generated HTML output. So you have this really complex dependency between the input and where in the output that's being used. And there's actually been a lot of work by the research community into this, this really, it's about context sensitivity in cross-site scripting. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of, if you go to the OWASP site, which I know some of you did for the project, there are a whole bunch of rules to how to never insert data and exactly what sanitizations you need uh, inside HTML comments, inside an attribute name, in a tag name. Oh, I didn't put the HTML comment. Yeah, HTML comment's an interesting one. Uh, you have to escape things, uh, and it depends on, so these characters are the XML parsing, the parsing characters that you need. Depends on if you're inside attributes, you need different things, depending on single quotes, double quotes, right? This is just, this is the OAuth solutions list, right? And it involves all these crazy rules that you have to keep in mind as you're doing it, right? Inside JavaScript strings, inside JavaScript variables, inside event handlers, it could be that you're using a bit inside a JavaScript code inside an event handler. Um, even, to make it even more crazy, we didn't talk about CSS. What's CSS used for, some of the web developers? Styling, right? It shows, yeah. So the HTML is more about the content of the page, and the CSS is supposed to be the how does that look, right? The styling of it. It's how you control all the things to do, like the rounded corners on boxes or whatever kind of stuff you want to do. Um, it turns out you can execute JavaScript inside CSS. There are rules in CSS where you can execute JavaScript. So now, if you're using any user input in your style sheets, right? Then you have to make sure that those are done properly. Um, and style sheets could be separate files. They could be embedded styles inside a style tag. They could be attributes on an element inside there. It's crazy. It keeps going. Uh, URLs, inside URLs, we, have, we can put data inside href tags. Image source, script source. So this cheat sheet has a very good list of how to actually prevent these things. And this is where this list comes from. Yeah. Uh, I see a lot of escape, escape. So is that the only solution? Like if a developer goes to an escape or the data to and fro both. Yes, and you have to be very careful. So the other alternative, which I don't see a lot of frameworks make, is you have to basically ensure that you have to can't just generate the HTML of the page by concatenating strings. That's the essential problem, is you're outputting an HTML response. You're creating it by a bunch of print statements, which are essentially string concatenation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a more principled way to do this would be on the server side, create the DOM that you want to send programmatically, and then send that, serialize it to HTML, and then send it. Uh, there has been some work done on that, I advise write a paper on that with using a type system in Haskell to make sure that you can actually do that. But unfortunately, nobody really does that. Um, the main way it's done that I see frameworks now is they have a specific, they use a templating language like we saw in Ruby that is restrictive, so it's not a whole programming language, mm -hmm. and they automatically sanitize, and they can usually tell, depending on the context, they can perform the correct sanitization. But they always give you the option to turn it off, unfortunately. Right? Because then it gets into the case which some of you are thinking about in your projects, right? What if I want to include links? What if I want to include some HTML? I want to include anchors, 
because I want people to comment and include links, but I don't want them to be able to execute JavaScript. Right? So that's like this cat and mouse game of you're trying to sanitize it or whitelist it, but every possible browser could parse things slightly differently in weird malformed cases, so you have to handle all the malformed cases. Uh, it turns into a huge problem. That's, I think, part of the reason why languages like Markdown have become more popular for doing that, because you can do that securely when you transform that. Questions? Cross-site scripting? All right, awesome. Now I'm kind of. Okay, we are going to look at that. We're going to look at some other web vulnerabilities that I wanted to get to if we had time, and we do have time. I just need to find out where the heck they are in all of this. Do we want to go over the same order policy again? Everyone remember? Okay. And I believe I need to turn on one of my VMs. I think I have an actual example here. All right. So, going back, right, we've seen what information does the web browser store for the server? What's that? Cookies. Yeah, cookies are the main one. Right? Um, what else? Does it store any other kind of data? Session data. Session data? Yeah, what other kind of session data besides cookies? Cache. What was that? Cache. Cache. Yeah, it actually stores, you can think of the cache of the history, right? Of the URLs that we've seen. What about like forms that are sent? So we saw that we can have forms of hidden attributes. Right? But where does that actually come from? I mean, the form comes from the server, but when we submit it, where does that data come from? The user, right? From us, from our browser, it gets sent again to the server. It actually turns out that plugins like Applet, Splash, and Silverlight, these can all store additional information. And actually, this is how they do, used to do, I'm sure they still do, now um, have cookies that expand. Um, oftentimes when you get rid of all your cookies, so like a lot of websites, a lot of companies want to track you online, right? So one way to do that is to use cookies, right? Cookies inherently track you online, but you can always delete all your cookies, and so the web server should see you as a brand new person. But what they do is the cookies, quote, quote, inside of Flash are different, and so they can have a little invisible Flash applet that stores a cookie, and the next time you visit that site after you've deleted your cookies, they pull that, what they call the super cookie from Flash, and then they can link you out to your previous browsing history. Right, that's a whole other area of research. Uh, there's also newer things like local storage. This actually allows JavaScript to store, I think up to like 50 megs by default, but it's configurable per website on your browser to actually store information on your browser on your this actually is really cool because it allows you to make <laughs> offline applications. Like Google Docs Offline uses the local storage to store locally your files. Yeah? Yeah, this was like the plugin Flash, there are plugins that run on the browser. So if I delete all my cookies, where would Flash store the cookies? It has its own cookie. It's not, it's, it's, not, it's not the same cookie. It's like a different storage mechanism. Like Flash allows each, I, I think it's origin, but it does allow applets or uh, flash, what do they call it? They're not applets. Movies, I guess I want to say. They can store some data in like a flash separate area. And because it's separate, when you delete cookies, your browser goes, yeah, I delete all the cookies, but because flash is outside of the browser, it doesn't know about those. Should also be able to track you through like private browsing mode, but that I don't know. I don't know how that works. Cool. Okay, so the class of attacks we want to talk about is how can we, so this is all information that's stored on our browser, right? On our machine. <coughs> so what, so we can actually, 
change this and mess with this data because it's on our machine before we send it back to the server, right? So there's absolutely nothing that prevents us from not tampering with or changing any of this client-side information, right? Everything we send to the server, we can change. Mm -hmm. We can change the URL that we access. We can change the refer referrer header that gets sent to say we actually came from a different URL. We could change any hidden forms that are stored on our browser. We could change the cookies that are stored. We can change anything, anything we want. So tampering by itself is not really a vulnerability. I mean, the fact that we can change things is built into the protocol. When would this become a vulnerability? When the tampered data is being used. Yes. If the server trusts that tampered data and uses it somehow, right? So the question is, what we want to try to determine is, how does the server-side code respond to our tampering? Does it reject the request? Or does it accept the request and accept that data that we sent? If it did, then we definitely have a problem, right? So the conditions are kind of, if the server-side code allows tampering, right, and that tampering somehow compromises the security of the application, right? If it just allows us to, I don't know, do nothing, like change our name, maybe that's interesting, but probably not. I mean, it has to actually compromise the security of the application then we actually have a vulnerability. So one of the ways this manifests itself is with hidden form fields, right? If those are sent from the client to the browser, and then when we fill out the form and hit enter, the browser then sends those back to the server. So the input element can have a type attribute of hidden, and then it won't be shown in the browser. And there's actually a lot of legitimate uses for this behavior, so why would you want to do this? Anybody who's done this before, or yeah. Actually, sometimes you want to send a unique ID or something which has no formatting, which wouldn't make sense to a person seeing it on the browser. Right, yeah, there may be, so kind of like actually almost for session purposes in some way, right? We may want to send some kind of unique session token to them and have them submit that back to us. What else? Okay. Configuration information. Configuration information, so what kind of stuff? Yeah. That the user wants. yeah, that's not important to the user, but maybe can affect how your code processes that request, right? Other things, CAPTCHA, right? So they actually sometimes will include these as a CAPTCHA uh, type thing. So the idea is if the CAPTCHA system, or if the bot changes that hidden form field, then they know it's probably a bot doing this and not a human, because a human would not change this field because they can't see it. Uh, Cross-site request forgery protection, which actually kind of gets into the, um, uh, specifically into the session information. Uh, we're not, I don't think we're a lot of time to talk about that, but you can look up what that is and why it's important. And the basic problem is if the server-side code, right, blindly trusts this data that's been placed there, if it just accepts it as valid as the truth, that's when we have a problem. If it's for some configuration changes, right, which it just doesn't really change it, then we're not going to have a problem. So let's consider, all right, we have, let's say we have some super simple forum, like a checkout, think about an e-commerce application. This is like a fake application that I've made. It actually doesn't even do anything. It's not actually an e-commerce application. This is also not my credit card number, by the way. Um, is it someone's? Actually, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. I made this a while ago, so we'll see. It's not long enough. It's not long enough? No. It is longer, I think. Four, four, four. I think there's one extra character. Yeah, you're right. It may also not pass the loan check. But if any of you guys want to volunteer and throw your credit card number on here, I'd be fine with that. <laughs> Right? So this is like a normal, you know, this is, think about the Amazon page, right? Before you finally click that purchase button, there's the page that says, has everything laid out, right? For all the things that you bought, how much you, the quantity of items that you bought and the price of each of those items and the total price, right? 
And so if we look at the, the HTML, if we look at this code, it looks something like this. So we have the stock type, we have a hidden form e-commerce application, uh, we have our checkout, our total price, our credit card number, and then we have that button, right? So what is that button, that purchase button? What, what do we think it probably is? Submit. Yeah, submit button, and what does a submit button mean? Form, right? It needs to be a part of a form because we need something to happen when we click that button. And we want it to be a post, right? Because we don't definitely don't want it to be a get request because that should be item potent and it should never change the state of the application, right? So in order to do that, that's why all the, it should be the case that all state changing applications are buttons, right? It's a form, but it didn't have any fields that we could actually change. But if we look, we saw maybe a purchase, actually let's, let's check this out real quick. So I believe I put this code on the server, we'll see how this goes. You should probably not be able to access that, so I would probably not try. I need to figure out the IP address of my machine. It's 172. And it was hidden form example. Success. Magic. Right? So here I have a confirmed checkout page. I have my laptop, my monitor. I'm getting a new computer. I'm pretty stoked about that. I then put a fake credit card, so I'm even more stoked that it accepted it. Right? And so we want to try to understand what this application does. Right? This is part of pen testing, part of finding vulnerabilities in applications, right? We want to interact with it to first find out what it does so we can know how to break the security. So if I click this purchase, it says, hey, your purchase was successful. Your final order, your final order total is 2,500 USD, charged to your credit card, XXXXXXX, whatever, right? So good. Okay, let's say we go through the process again. Let's look at this page. So we can right click always and say view source, which will show us the source code of this page. So here, right here is the form. It's action is purchase.php, so we know that purchase page is going to get called. It's going to pass in its parameters with post, which makes sense. We have our input of type submit and a value of purchase, right? So that's where that purchase button came from. And then we have a series of hidden fields, right? We have some OID, right? some price, and some curve. So what do we think these are? Remember, we don't know the source code of this application. right? We're just in a black box way. So what do we think this OID probably refers to? Order ID, probably. Yeah, it's probably linking right that order that I want to purchase this order. Uh, the price. Yeah, the total price in dollars it looks like, since this is the price here. What about current? Currency. Currency, Currency. yeah. Cool, so how do I mess with these? Change the price. What do you want to do? You want to change the price first? Okay, so I first need to put this in developer mode. Does developer mode work on Windows? Maybe I don't have to talk to their head, more tools. There you go. Developer tools. Right, so this will show me, actually it's very cool, this will show me the whole uh, DOM of the page. So this shows me the DOM and I can access it just like a tree. Right, so I can look at all these values in here. So there's actually a few ways I can do this that's pretty cool. I can actually just double click in here. What, how, what do you want? Minus one. Wow, all of you have very different levels of risk. <laughs> Zero, negative one, negative 5,000. Yeah. I said 25. Oh, 25? <laughs> oh, you want to go to the opposite here? No, negative 25. Negative 25,000. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Now when we click purchase, what's going to happen? I'm going to get 5,000. <laughs> Fail. Not the correct price. One dollar? Let's 
Probably one dollar. Fail. Not the correct price. Oh. But if we try one dollar less, maybe that'll. Two. So what about the order ID? Maybe we can buy somebody else's order? Fail, not our order. So then maybe what can we change? Currency. Currency? What's another currency? SEK. SEK? What is that? So yeah, so the idea is we want to see what the hidden values are. We want to try to learn what they mean, how the application uses them first, and then try to see about actually creating, changing the price. We tried changing it to a negative number, which would have been cool. We tried changing it to zero. We tried just changing it a little bit, and none of those worked, right? So we had to try to do, and the key thing here when you're trying these things is you want to have some kind of hypothesis in your mind. Right, like, okay, if the, I put the price negative, it should A, allow me to buy it, and B, should refund money back on my credit card. Right, that's your hypothesis. It turns out it failed, it did not work. Wait, where are we? Okay. Cool. So, that was hidden form fields, right? So we can change hidden form fields, and we saw it's actually trivial to do this. Right? Absolutely nothing stops you from changing those. Unless there was some, maybe you could use some crypto to change it, but even then it's, you're essentially making sure that they're tamper proof. It's also not a guarantee that they did not reuse that from somebody else, or you don't have any other kind of shenanigans that can be played with uh, even encrypted things. Yes? If you put them inside the script, make some noise. If you put what? Uh, script tags? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. This I wasn't even. This is pre, you know. <laughs> cro this could be a cross-site scripting vector. Exactly. Is the the um, the currency tag could have been a cross-site? Actually, should we try it? All right. Here we are at the page. Change currency. So one 
one thing we have to do is we have to uh, actually view the source of this page because we don't know, yeah. So now you can see here that it is properly being sanitized. Right? So no vulnerability. But we just got a laptop and a monitor for 80 cents, so I think that's pretty good. Although I wonder if we have to pay foreign transaction fees. I don't know, but that would be worth it. Right? Cool, all right. So that's what we want to get through today. It's good. On Wednesday, we'll continue uh, look at some other cool web vulnerabilities like this.